So my name is Jeff Tumlin, uh, and I am a transportation policy nerd at Nelson Nygaard. We're a consulting company that mostly gets in the space in between mostly municipal governments, but all kinds of government agencies and private providers of mobility, making sure that we use the public right-of-way, or in this case, the public airspace, for the public good, while at the same time promoting innovation and private profit. I'm Will Haburn. Uh, I work for Blade, which is the largest arranger of civilian helicopter travel in the United States. Our focus is on getting people in and out of congested urban environments uh, as quickly and as cost effectively as is possible using current technology with an ultimate goal of creating a platform that will transition to future, quieter, less expensive electric flying technology. Uh, we can get you to any New York City airport all day long for just $195 now. Um, and we're here to talk about urban aviation. So urban aviation is something that we've been talking about, well, really since the time of Aladdin, for a very, very long time. Um, and there's always been this amazing fantasy, and I'm sure you have all seen the promotional videos or you know, watched the Jetsons, or the promotional videos where, and we were actually going to show one, but the lawyers at Ford decided <laughs> that may not be appropriate, but there are so many of them, and you have seen them, and they're so alluring. So first of all, it's all about you, right? And you're, you're, uh, you just finished a successful business meeting, um, you go to the curb to you know, get in your car or get into your ride hill vehicle and there's congestion on the street and it's awful. And so you take out your phone and you turn and you go to the elevator and you go up to the 58th floor uh, of the downtown high rise. And of course, the, 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 there's no wind, the air is perfectly still, <laughs> right? And there's all these helpful people there who whisk you to the perfect little urban aviation device, probably designed by Johnny Ivey, and you know, it's just it's meticulously designed. And some beautiful person hands you a glass of champagne, and suddenly you're whisked off. Thank you. Thought something fell there. Suddenly you're, 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 you're whisked off. And the real money shot is when you look down below with your glass of champagne at the horrible traffic congestion on the ground and you feel so good that you get to bypass all of those people down below. Um, and suddenly you arrive refreshed and your family's there to greet you and life is so good, right? It's a beautiful vision. Um, and particularly if you're living here in Los Angeles and you're spending so much of your life stuck in soul-crushing congestion. And if we can't add another lane off to the side of the freeway, and if they won't let Elon Musk build another lane under the freeway, well, our only real option for solving all of our mobility problems is, of course, the sky. So um, in my work, I try to understand the history of every new innovation in mobility um, and understand the difference between the promise of that technology and the reality, gaming through unintended consequences. Um, and there have been a few. So the automobile you know, was originally promised, right? And when you go back to the 1920s, the promise of the automobile was that it was going to eliminate both pollution and congestion by getting rid of all those messy horses that were clogging up our streets, right? It was gonna be awesome. So I'm actually really happy to have a Will Haywood with Blade here, because unlike maybe some of your competitors, um, your innovation is grounded in the reality of current technology and current services and an understanding of the limitations and an understanding of the regulatory context. So Will, tell us a little bit about your vision of what your company is trying to achieve and where, where you're going in the future. Well, th thank you for that setup, uh, Jeffrey. And uh, it, you know, he, he's right, we don't, we don't have magic carpets, we have helicopters. Uh, but our view is that uh, the, the, the videos that you see on the internet with drones that evoke memories of the Jetsons, they're great, but we don't need to wait for that technology to, to start offering urban air mobility solutions today. And in fact, if we do use current technology and start providing solutions that, that maybe aren't accessible to everyone, but they're accessible to some significant group of people, 
we'll actually get to that world that we see in the CG videos a little bit faster. Uh, so, so what Blade has done is we've tried to eliminate the waste from helicopter travel. So take New York City as a case study. Uh, before Blade came on the scene in 2014, if you wanted to take a helicopter from Manhattan to JFK, the way that it would work is that you would call or fax someone who had helicopters likely based in upstate New York. They would spin up from uh, Poughkeepsie or from Caldwell, New Jersey, and they would fly 15 to 20 minutes to Manhattan where they would pick you up, take you to JFK, five minutes, and then fly back to their base another 25 minutes. So you had 45 minutes of flight time that you didn't need, and you were likely using a helicopter that was too big for the mission you had. So what we've been able to do is by working with our partners, which include Airbus, one of our biggest investors, Lockheed Martin, and Bell Helicopter, we've picked the right, most fuel-efficient helicopter for the mission, and every morning for each airport, we reposition one helicopter to Manhattan, and we fly back and forth continuously so that the only jet fuel you need to use is what it takes to take that short five-minute flight between JFK and Manhattan or vice versa. So we can now price that consistently all day long at $195, which is actually less than you might pay for an Uber SUV. And if you look at the amount of fuel you burn on a helicopter full of six people, the fuel per person is actually comparable to taking your own SUV. Uh, in many cases, it's less. I'm, I'm sure a Ford SUV is much more efficient, though. Uh, but, but maybe a Chevy SUV uh, burns a little bit more. So, so by doing this, we've been able to show all the aircraft manufacturers that this is a real market. And we comply with all the regulations that exist under the DOT and FAA regulations today. And we, we think about what we've done much in the same way that Netflix thought about how they got started, which was sending DVDs in the mail. Not exactly a tech company, but the technology that they built to show you movies you want and the content they acquired and the brand that they built was all relevant to streaming. And so when streaming came along, they were ready and they won. Uh, so electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft is our streaming. We're, we're using helicopters today, but in the process of using helicopters, we're building the market. We have 170,000 users. We have a brand. We've built the infrastructure and the expertise to get six people that don't know each other onto a helicopter. And we think we can get the world there faster. And the ultimate goal is, of course, not to be using helicopters, but to be using something that's quieter and less expensive and get the price point to where it really is comparable or, or even below what you might pay for a private car. So I love riding in helicopters, um, but there are some downsides to helicopters. Uh, I, I was born in Los Angeles, and I grew up in a, in a poor neighborhood. So my childhood experience with helicopters is police surveillance helicopters coming around <laughs> every night and shining spotlights in our backyards. Uh, as, uh, what were you up to? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right? So uh, nothing, in fact. Uh, helicopters is a tool of surveillance and a tool of oppression. Uh, it, like, there's a powerful association. I grew up in Little Saigon, and my neighbors had an even darker association with helicopters. Um, so there's noise. There is CO2 emissions. There is um, the, our, the part of our uh, reptilian brain that doesn't like uh, things hovering above our heads, right? There are some social consequences to urban aviation. How do we promote innovation and convenience while at the same time dealing with the negative consequences of this particular mode? In our mind, you just have to work with the communities in which you operate. So uh, I'll give you an example. But uh, it's very difficult in aviation to get what's called a TFR, a temporary flight restriction. Uh, communities try to get them all the time. And in New York, for those of you who spend time in Manhattan, you may realize there's Shakespeare in the Park every summer. Unfortunately, Shakespeare in the Park, the theater, is directly under the cross Manhattan helicopter noise abatement route as set by the FAA. Uh, they, they tried to work and, and get a, a temporary flight restriction. They were unable to do it. So instead, they came to Blade. And because we represent 70% of the business of helicopter operators in New York City, what we were able to do is just say, look, don't fly over Shakespeare, or you're never flying for us again, 
And in fact, don't even do it if you're not flying for us, or just don't bother showing up the next day. And you know what? Nobody flew over Shakespeare in the park. So it, as long as you can be a good citizen of your community, and you pick geographies to test this technology that are mostly on the water, and you can fly over the water to reduce noise, it's, it's a great lab for City 2.0. So, so, Wait, you know, so, so you're saying that the industry should regulate itself and that companies are good citizens and will always uh, do the right thing? There, there's, a, there's a delicate balance. There's a delicate balance. But because regulation can be slow, yeah. uh, if, you're, if you want to see progress, you can't steamroll regulation just because you can get away with it. Yeah. Uh, you, you probably could. Uh, there, there's no reason. Uh, you couldn't fly over Shakespeare in the park, but that would be a bad thing to do. So, so I think as long as you're mindful about the needs of the community and you pick places where you can minimize the harm of the innovation that you're trying to push forward. Like over water. Like over water. Mm -hmm. There's a great opportunity to push things forward uh, with limited harm to people who aren't currently benefiting. And also the great thing about aviation is that the infrastructure is already there. So the heliports already exist. And to expand the service, you fly more, but you're not making a permanent change to a community the way a road or a tunnel sometimes requires. So it's actually the perfect mobility solution to experiment. And we can try things. And if a community decides this isn't working for us, you can stop. And you haven't put a permanent black mark on the community. So let's, let's actually talk a little bit more about regulation. Um, the United States has a very mixed history with how it regulates uh, technology, um, with some, I think, really remarkable success, like the Federal Communications Commission that seized authority over the entire electromagnetic spectrum you know, above the United States and said, we're going to regulate the airwaves to promote private profit and innovation um, by, in part, promoting competition and also promoting the public good at the same time by actually putting regulatory fees on all the providers in order to support public programming um, and also making sure that people aren't competing against the same, uh, get, competing against each other within the same uh, 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 band. Um, and then there are examples of failure, like the taxi cab, taxi cab regulations that were basically established to solve the problems of the 1930s and took a control rather than outcome-based regulatory approach. Um, and as a result, um, not only basically destroyed the industry by allowing Uber and Lyft to enter the marketplace, um, but destroyed the livelihoods. I don't know if you, any of you saw the amazing series the New York Times did this week on the collapse of medallion values uh, in uh, for New York City cabbies, right? I mean, by taking innovation out of the marketplace. Taxi cab regulations actually destroyed the very industry they were trying to protect. So for aviation, the FAA, I think, has done a better job than other regulators. But what should the FAA be doing in order to regulate better outcomes rather than control, simply limit the industry? How can the uh, regulators promote innovation while at the same time upholding the public good? by defining it. So, so it's actually not so much the FAA, is local communities mm -hmm. that control the infrastructure. So a great idea that we had that we think would push everyone towards the right outcome and provide a great market-based incentive is what if communities look at the infrastructure they already have and the limitations that they've placed on it, maybe to reduce noise? Mm -hmm. and, and what if you create a market-based incentive to push to technology that's quieter? So I'll give you a real life example. Uh, the East 34th Street heliport in Manhattan is closed on the weekends. It used to be open, but it's closed. And that's a decision the community made because of noise. Uh, what if you created a positive market incentive and said, if you have an aircraft that can be less than x decibels on takeoff and landing, you can fly on the weekends. Or, or less than x pounds of CO2 per passenger. Wh whatever, maybe both. Mm -hmm. wh whatever the case may be. Now you've created an even bigger market that didn't exist, and there's another reason for aircraft manufacturers to push that technology forward. And all you're doing is creating an opportunity for a transportation alternative that you agree is okay and meets the parameters that you set, 
and then benefit from the landing fees, which you can direct towards whatever other public projects you want to. Ah, okay, so let's talk about landing fees, because of course another criticism of ur urban aviation is, isn't this yet another opportunity for a more exquisite convenience for the wealthy at the expense of everyone else? So how, how do we correct for the fact that urban aviation will continue to be more expensive and more energy consuming than ground-based transportation? You impose landing fees on people and, and you direct them wherever you want, but I would say you have to be very careful about overcorrecting. Aviation as a whole started as a very expensive product reserved for people that had the money to fly. Cars started the same way. Cars started the same way. I, I don't think you would advocate that we never should have gone down that road. I think we'd all agree that having vehicles and, and having aircraft, uh, and we have Spirit Airlines now. I don't, I don't think people anticipated Spirit Airlines when they were flying in the 1950s. Uh, but we got there, and it's now very accessible. So we've already made tremendous progress, even on urban air mobility. We've gone from that $3,000 helicopter that was repositioning from God knows where to $195. There's more room to grow if you don't stifle the economic model by overtaxing. So let's say we set our fees and our regulations correctly. We work to minimize harm. And that allows the Henry Ford of aviation to come forward and invent the Model T urban you know, aviation device, whatever that might be. Right. Uh, and we have a dramatic expansion in urban air travel. What does that look like? What does the city of the future with ubiquitous urban air travel actually look like? What are the, and what are the consequences of that? I, I think it starts much with just an expansion of service that is already possible with today's infrastructure. A and then you have to earn the right to expand to new places. And, and that's the way that we're approaching it, a very gradual evolutionary rather than revolutionary approach to expanding service. So why don't you try going from West 30th Street on the water in Manhattan mm -hmm to JFK, where, where you're predominantly flying over the river, mm -hmm. uh, and start adding to that service, and make sure it works. If it does, why don't you think of a few new places to land? Uh, in LA, it's pretty difficult to, if those of you who flew in LAX, it's a little bit of a tough drive to downtown LA from LAX. Uh, we'll be testing that tonight. If anybody needs to fly from downtown LA to LAX for $195, you can at 8 p.m. We'll, we'll do a test. Uh, so, so download the Blade app and you can check it out. But we wouldn't just jump into doing that every single day, uh, all day long. You need to test and see what the routes are and, and make sure it makes sense for the community. But as a business person, right, and uh, you know, with investors, so I, I mean, I, I respect your company's incrementalism approach, but I also need to think that you have, like, you've got to have a 15-year plan. What does that look like? Or, or what's the 30-year horizon looking like that you're pulling forward to? Or are you really just like, you know, uh, doing incremental expansion like a, you know, like, like a retailer would? To, to, to be honest, we're completely equipment agnostic. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very difficult to predict not only when technology is going to be feasible, but when regulators are going to decide that it's OK to use for commercial service. So. Mm -hmm. You, you, in our mind, in the next three, four, maybe five years, you're not likely to see pilotless drones. Tell, uh, me, tell us why. If, if you think about the cost of a flight hour, the cost of the pilot is actually a pretty small percentage of the cost. Do you know what the, what the percentage is? It depends on the aircraft, but it could be as low as 15% of the cost. Whereas with like Uber and Lyft, the operator is almost 50% of the cost. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you also have to think about what's the intrinsic traffic control system? So on the roads, the intrinsic traffic control system is not very good. Tens of thousands of people die every week. In the air, the intrinsic system for air traffic control is, is quite safe. Actually, uh, ground-based transportation is not quite that bad. We only kill 100 people a week in the United States uh, through cars. Is that it? It's not tens of thousands. It's, it's 100. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's 100 people a day. That's right. So Here we go. Yeah. So. We'll add in the rest of the world and... Yeah, so it's a 747 a week we kill by letting humans drive wow. cars. Yeah. Wow. 
<laughs> so <laughs> you have a pretty safe system, and the pilot is a pretty small percentage of the cost. Mm -hmm. You may not be incentivized to remove the pilot right away, but what you will be incentivized to do is to build an electric flying machine. And so our view of the world is in, in the next four or five years, you'll see what, what is essentially an electric helicopter. Uh, it's regulated just like a helicopter today. It's piloted by an experienced helicopter, maintained by someone who also owns helicopters, but is quiet and carbon neutral and hopefully less expensive, though it might not be. The first Tesla mm -hmm. was not less expensive than uh, the, the internal combustion engine cars that were available. The, the first EV tall electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft might be similar, so it could be that the customers that we have today at 195 are actually gonna be the right customers for the first generation of electric urban air mobility. Uh, that will support the market, and then hopefully version 2.0 becomes less expensive. So we see a world with pilots for a very long time. In fact, even if you showed up tomorrow and said, well, I've, I've got a pilotless drone and I'm gonna fly people around, I would put a pilot in an aircraft just to compete with you on customer service. Mm -hmm. And I think most of the people in this room would probably, raise your hand if you prefer to have a pilot in your airplane. <laughs> Okay, we got a few people that yeah. like to live on the wild side. I want my personal jetpack, frankly. Yeah. I'm, a, I'm an introvert. There you go. Yeah. Um, so I don't know if you know the answer to this question, but what percentage of the energy associated with aviation is about upward thrust, like getting the vehicle up versus moving the vehicle forward? There, there is more energy consumed on the takeoff, mm -hmm. and there's more noise on the takeoff mm -hmm. than there is in cruise. Right, so it's gonna ultimately be a limitation in terms of the energy efficiency. Even if we can get towards an electric vertical takeoff and landing device that's quieter, it's still gonna need to use more energy than what the equivalent efficiency gains you might be able to get through ground-based transport. I'm not an engineer, mm -hmm. but that sounds intuitive to me. <laughs> okay. and, and no one's saying that, that urban air mobility is gonna be the way to get around. You know, our vision of City 2.0 is a wide variety of urban air mobility, train, bike, scooter, whatever it is. In fact, we have a little microcosm in, of it in New York already, which is Hudson Yards. Mm -hmm. Hudson Yards has the seven train, mm -hmm. it has city bikes, mm -hmm. it has the Blade Lounge just a thousand feet away, uh, and it has mixed commercial, residential, and retail all in one place so people who live there can walk most places. So unlike, say, Blade Runner or Fifth Element, where urban aviation is used as, a, as the means to completely avoid managing anything at the ground and let the, all the disadvantaged just sort of struggle to find their way on the ground, like, Urban aviation is just a piece of a very complicated multimodal system. And it's, like it's, I said at the beginning, you have to use the right equipment for the mission, mm -hmm. even if that equipment is a scooter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and I, I don't, at least I don't envision a world where you're getting an a aircraft to pick you up outside your apartment in Soho via an app. Mm -hmm. uh, you might take a scooter mm -hmm. to a vertiport mm -hmm. that is strategically positioned near water yeah. uh, and, and hopefully is using a quieter aircraft. Mm -hmm. So then it can fly lower, so you don't have to waste all that energy going up. Uh, and you use whatever medium is appropriate at the time. Right, and for coastal cities, the bulk of airports, uh, you know, international airports, are located at the water's edge. Right. Yeah. So it's, it's, a great, it's a great lab. It's a great way to test the potential of this mm -hmm. technology in a way that doesn't cause permanent change to a community. Uh, it, it, we can already do it with today's technology for about the price of a black car. Uh, and if we need to make incremental changes in consultation with the communities and regulators and thought leaders, we can do that. We haven't made a permanent change. I, I'd, I'd be interested in your views looking back historically. You know, are, are, are there times when, whether it was regulators or the private sector, ha have they made changes to the fabric of communities for infrastructure purposes that you think were a mistake? <laughs> well, I mean, the whole history of the arrival of the automobile in American cities, uh, at least in the urban component of that, was a complete disaster. I mean, I would argue that the interstate highway system connecting cities and states was one of the wisest major infrastructure investments this country ever made, but imposing that rural view on urban places was one of the worst disasters we've ever created. 
Um, and all of that was done very consciously. And it was done through regulations that were established in the 1930s, but didn't actually come into full fruition until the 1950s. And that's exactly what's happening today again with topics like autonomous vehicles um, as the state legislatures um, are one by one favoring rural and corporate profit interests and not understanding unintended negative consequences for the public good, particularly in cities. So, so how does government provoke, promote in, innovation while still keeping that public good in mind? Well, by number one, focusing on outcomes rather than focusing on control. And number two, defining the public good, which we're weirdly uncomfortable doing in the United States. I think our current political divisiveness um, makes it harder for us to have grown up conversations about values, right? So to what degree should we be using technology to equalize opportunity? As you know, Hannah Beekler said this morning, like how do we put people before technology? and define what it is that people need. So, you know, in mobility, I would argue we're primarily in the business of creating land value, but we're also the greatest driver of opportunity or privilege. Um, and through our regulations, we can decide whether mobility technology is something that we use to spark additional innovation and efficiency and economic growth for everyone, or simply create ever greater uh, convenience for the privileged. Right. We need to have a conversation about that and to gain through the unintended negative consequences of technology and not, not simply be trapped by those beautiful video simulations that so many technology providers um, sell us. Don't be fooled by them. But do you think it's okay to create a near-term benefit for the privileged, privilege with the hope of leading to innovation that is gonna have broader appeal? Almost all the best innovations in human history have been driven by for-profit private entities and all of the early adopters for most technology, uh, with a couple of interesting exceptions, um, have been the wealthiest, right? So it's how we innovate in America. Um, and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. In fact, I think it's an essential element of our national identity, but we do need to be continually thinking through and managing the potential downside um, and making sure that the benefits of technology accrue to everyone and to society as a whole rather than to just a few investors in the wealthy. Should, we take, should we take a couple questions? minutes for questions? Questions from the audience. Yes, over there, and you can just, oh yeah, there's a mic. Hi, Craig Stevens from Ford. Can you talk a little bit about the role of the pilot? You know, today a helicopter pilot is a highly skilled individual with some of the things we see with uh, new approaches, right, the EV tolls and so on, do you see that skill level changing, being more supervisory, or do you see it requiring the same skill level? We, we see it staying very much the same for a very long period of time, uh, both because it makes consumers more comfortable, but also because the air that we fly in, uh, people have the wrong perception. It's, it's much more similar to driving than you might think. Uh, particularly when you're flying in a helicopter, you're often flying in visual airspace. Uh, you know, the helicopters that we use have indicators for every aircraft that's nearby and their altitude, but you actually don't have to have that equipment on an aircraft, and people might keep flying an old Cessna for 30 years. So for a long time, we're going to be cohabitating visual airspace with visual pilots. And so you're gonna need to have someone who understands those rules, understands how to communicate with people that are in the air for, for quite some time. Uh, there's a lot of great companies that are working on pilot-assisted technology, and that's all fantastic. Uh, but I don't think the level of qualifications that you'll see from a pilot or the number of hours that you'd want someone to have in terms of experience before flying commercially should change anytime soon. More questions? Hi, John Graff from Arisen Foundation. How scalable do you see this? And in terms of competition for the airspace, you have all these developments now um, with the drones and drone delivery services. And you know, your, your airspace is going to get more and more crowded. So how do you manage that? And, and maybe this is for Jeffrey in terms of the role of regulation in that. We're here, I'll, I'll set you up. 
Yeah. So how do you take something that is currently self-regulated? That's mm -hmm. visual flight rules airspace. It's self-regulated. There's no one saying there's too many planes in the air, you can't go. So if the incumbent system is self-regulated uh, and you're putting more volume through it, yep. how should a government approach that? Well, and also interestingly, it's by far the safest form of mobility in human history, right? So how, right. Do, you t how do you take a system that has a spectacular safety record compared to every other mode uh, and not mess that up, right? So uh, again, I think from a regulatory response, it is about outcomes. It's about taking safety very seriously, which the FAA currently does, and on the motor vehicle side, we don't. We put convenience ahead of safety for motor vehicles. So how do we deal with safety? How do we deal with noise? How do we deal with, the as the Federal Communications Commission does, using fees on communications to establish lifeline telephone service for rural Americans, a program that was revolutionary in the 1930s and persists to this day, super important. So I think learning from the success of particularly those early 20th century regulatory approaches that continue to work really well today, learning from the success of the current federal aviation rules and the positive results that they've created, and then simply correcting for um, those negative consequences while gaming through unintended, you know, tertiary con consequences. It's how you gotta do it. And not, and then continue to adjust over time, right? Another mistake that we made with taxis is we didn't update the regulations since 1935. Other questions over here? Just shout it out. Charlie Vogel, hi, from the Flying Star. Um, Will, do you, uh, you talk about flying over water, and that's great in the Bay Area and other places. Um, do, do you see that's where, where the growth is all going to happen? And are you guys going any other forms of transportation? Do you do things like ferries or, or other aspects of that? So, so over water is the best way to minimize noise in noise-sensitive environments. You can fly over industrial. And also, you can avoid taking off, not over water. So oftentimes, if you're flying at 1,000 feet, the noise is less of a concern. Uh, airplanes fly much higher and, and fly over cities. So I think there's, there's a happy medium of uh, building heliports on the water is a good idea to minimize noise. But you could fly over a populated area at a higher altitude and minimize noise that way. Uh, in, in terms of being multimodal, uh, we're focused on urban air mobility. The name of the company is Blade Urban Air Mobility. But what I'll say is that oftentimes to deliver a great end-to-end -end customer experience, you have to involve other modes. So when you land at JFK, there's a car waiting for you, your Blade car, to take you two minutes to the terminal. If we didn't have that, uh, try ordering an Uber to Shelf Air at JFK. You're, you're, you're going to have a hard time. Uh, when our seaplanes land on the water, often they're met by a boat. So, so we're multimodal in that sense, but only to enable urban air mobility. And with that, we are at time. Thank you very much for joining us.